Welcome again to the History Bards podcast. I'm host Dee Marley, and I'm glad you are joining us today. Today, we have the great privilege of featuring award-winning historical author Danuta Pfeiffer to the show. And as a way of introduction to our listeners, Danuta was a national radio and television broadcast journalist, columnist, and talk show host for 35 years. She is the author of four books. Her first book, Water Save Your Baby in One Week, was the first book on teaching water survival skills to infants and the first to be endorsed by the American Red Cross. Once called the most visible woman in modern Christianity today, she was known as the popular co-host of the 700 Club with Pat Robertson. Her book, Chiseled, explains more about her time as co-host. Danuta soon returned to her liberal roots, expressing her progressive views on radio stations affiliated with Air America. Her recent books revolving around the Oregon Trail, Libertas, and Fermitas, book one and book two in the Pocket Full of Seeds trilogy, are now available at Amazon and other booksellers worldwide. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Danuta. How are you doing? Oh, thank you, Dee. I am just doing so well. I, I, um, I'm writing up a storm, and hey. um, and life, life is good. That's great, and everybody's excited for your for for you to be writing. That's that's really, especially me. You know, I I love your book, so that's really exciting to know that you're working on your next one. <laughs> thank you, we miss. Yeah. So to start off with, since this interview is about you, we would love for you to tell us more about your journey as a writer and why you got into writing historical fiction. Well, I think like anybody who has a passion to doing things, uh, you you start you start early and you don't know. I don't know why I love to write, but even as a little girl, I was running out into the woods in Northern Michigan and found a a big tall fern and I would sit underneath (laughs) it with my, with my sharpened pencils and my 500 pack uh, of paper. And I was writing poetry and small stories and, and really um, uh, it was just in me. Um, but you know, life takes turns and, um, I ended up, uh, ended up going into journalism. Um, uh, and, and then that took me into another career, but I was always writing even, even then. So I've had a rather interesting and colorful life. And so (laughs) around that journey, uh, I started writing about that journey and, and really the first, the first, uh, book about my journey was chiseled right but it took me 25 years to write that and because the ending kept changing I mean when you write a (laughs) memoir yeah (laughs) you think you're done but you're never done (laughs) so um and as and as readers of chiseled understand uh there were a lot of uh there were a lot of dramatic twists in the and what I thought was the ending Uh but um and so after Chiseled, I uh, I just wanted to write something a little more fanciful, get get out of my head a little bit, and uh, and see what the rest of the world had to offer to my imagination. Yeah, that's and and again, everybody should go out and buy these books. Definitely, I'm going to talk a little bit later about the reviews that we did on your books. Um, of course, you know how we all feel here at the Historical Fiction Company. We love your books so much. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So in saying that, um, for our listeners, can you tell us a little bit more about the premise of the of um, both books and what you're working on now? Well, the premise of A Pocket Full of Seeds is starts with two slaves, two escaped slaves uh, who have fallen in love with one another and they um, they run. Uh, they run through 19th century America and all the, all the unusual, uh, things that are happening in that era of 19th century America. I tried to make it an experience for these two people, Frederica and Horace, and eventually they make it to the Oregon trail. They get into a wagon train and, um, and they're, they're going across the country. So, 
So I have a trilogy that is um, book one, two, and I'm working on three. Uh, and and it's it's uh, it sort of incorporates all the angst and despair and hopes and dreams and and um, judgments and yeah. um, racism and and everything you can think of that is a human quality that we all bear right. as human beings. Um, my characters um, uh, are in contact with that. Uh, so it's not only on a physical level, but it's um, an emotional level. And it also speaks to the national, oh, the national mindset of 19th century America. Right. It isn't pretty much different than today. <laughs> right. That's that's very true. <laughs> some things that's never change. Right. <laughs> no. We wish they would, but some things never change. So I'm really curious. So what drew you to this era to write about this particular era? Just that well, that what you were talking about. Well, my husband, Robin, uh -huh. uh, told me the story of digging for uh, digging for an irrigation pit on on our property. And he was witching with, you know, with the willow stick. He can mm -hmm. find water that way. <laughs> so he was witching with the stick and and he had a big he had a big um, hole that came in and started digging where he said, you know, dig here. And mm -hmm. so this this great big claw is coming out and digging into this hole and as and as they're digging for the water they're pulling out bits and pieces of things and oh. one of them was a was a brass rein a brass bridle um wow. just knotted with brass and um robin said People don't bury brass. Yeah. Why is there brass buried here? Yeah. So as they kept digging, they they pulled up a piece of wood. They pulled up um, ho uh, horses uh, collars, wow. and um, and and then it 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 struck him. He said, "You know, there was a there was a legend on this property, and the legend was that um, people who had." owned the property generations before had two sons they were they were on a hay wagon going across the field and the wagon tipped over when the horse was startled oh. and so the oldest son was immediately killed and the father was so grieved that he shot the horses right where they lay wow. and buried everything in a right there and the entire family left the property and never came back. Oh my goodness. Well, well this really um set something going in me. Yeah. I kept thinking, who were they? Yes. Why were they there? What 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 was the backstory of that? What happened to these people? And so as I started in my mind trying to make the story fit my imagination, I started writing notes. And before you knew it, I was yeah. in 19th century America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think and we I'm can a, all relate to that. <laughs> so I was I was into a Western. So yeah. um, so it took me about five years of just research. Yeah. Um just lots of research and uh, uh, and books piled, you know, four and five feet high. Yeah. Um, and and finally, COVID hit, yeah. and there were no phone calls, there were no right. meetings, there right. were no lunches to go to, there was yeah. you know no vacations to take, and it was uh, it was time to write. So I spent that whole year. Uh, taking all that information and filtering it into the first book, Libertas, which means freedom. In right. and, and I think the I think your choices of titles are just brilliant. Um, whenever I first saw, whenever you submitted for the contest and the review and everything, I just loved the title. And then you oh, just, yeah. you're continuing in it. And when Fermitas came out, I was like, well, this is just great. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm working on the third one, you know, yeah, um, yeah. the third title. It has to sort of, it has to sort of ring true with the Latin. Right, so, right. <laughs> um, yes, yeah. I'm. Don't tell I'm us because I'm one. sure you're working on it. We don't mm -hmm. want to know yet. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> well, you kind of just told us a little bit about the research you did and some of the obscure things you found. Is there anything else that you came across in your research that you'd love to share with us? Oh, gosh. Yes. I mean, okay. 
there was there was so much. Uh, yeah. The one thing that really blew my mind in Firmitas, uh, one of the uh, one of the subplots is the um, is the Donner Party, uh, because the Donner Party in 1846 was going across the country uh, at the same time that my protagonists were also. Yeah. And so I've got the Donners in there and their incredible most unbelievable journey a lot of people think that the donner party you know the big story was in the was in the mountains of the sierra where they Uh were caught by that snowstorm well that was only half of it um i mean when you read firmitas you're going to you're going to find that there's a lot more to the story and they were in trouble way before they got to the sierra yeah but one of the most important one of the little nuggets that nobody ever i don't I've never heard this spoken of before, but but one of the friends of the Donners um, is, a, is a man called James Reed. It was actually called the uh, Donner Reed Party. Mm-hmm. And James Reed was a friend with a man in the, in, in the uh, army. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, it was a military brigade. And they were always talking about going to California. Well, when James Reed met up with Donner and said, hey, we're going to California, he called his friend and said, hey, you always wanted to go to go to California. We're on our way. And his friend was all ready to go. And um, the his he was married to a woman named Mary. And Mary was pregnant and she had a four year old. And Mary said, you can't go because you know, I've got this baby, right. I've got this other baby, and you have a, you, you have a career in law. So Abe Lincoln did not join the Donner Party because of Mary. And I like to think that the entire history of the United States of America was, um, could have been so much different yeah. But for a woman saying no, <laughs> and, uh, I, I was just amazed because, you know, Abe Lincoln would not have made it. Uh, yeah. he, he, you know, he was a, he was frail. There was yeah. no way Abe Lincoln would have made it with the Donners. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and, and history would have taken an incredible hit. Um, and it's hard to imagine where we would be today without Mary Lincoln saying yeah. no. Yeah, that's and, amazing. And I think it's fascinating. <laughs> and they were at, um, at least Mary was at the farewell party for the Donners when they left St. Louis. Oh, wow. That's just, I yeah. mean, like you said, I've never heard that story. And that's, that's amazing. No. And no. you're right. That, it would have changed everything. <laughs> everything. Yeah. And the other thing I thought, oh, there were many, 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 many things that I uncovered. And one of the things that, that also was fascinating to me, and I, I've never heard people speak about this either, was that Buffalo, New York experienced a tsunami. Yeah. I mean, who knew? I know. Uh, there's a tsunami in Buffalo, New York. Yeah. And it happened at night. And it was because Lake Erie is narrow and shallow. And there was this huge windstorm that pushed all the water to one end. Mm-hmm. And then the wind changed direction at midnight and took all that water and thrust it into Buffalo while everybody was sleeping. Yeah. So there were steamships in, you know, on, on Main Street. Right. And um, and many, many, many people were killed. And it was just fascinating to me that there's such a thing as a lake tsunami. Yeah, I think whenever I read that, um, you know, that's one of the things I love about historical fiction is because when you read something and then it makes you want to go research it, and and I definitely did that with your book because I was like, wait a minute, what? I've never heard of this before. And when I looked it up, I was just like, what? I This history is just amazing. And that's what historical fiction does. It teaches as well as entertains. And I think that's what's so brilliant about it. Well, what's also, it's like, right, it's like painting. It's sort of like you, yeah. you, you have this anecdote out of, you know, a true story. And yeah. then you weave that you you weave those colors into your own uh, fictionalized characters, and you bring these real life anecdotes in, and and let make history come alive again. Yeah. You know, it it really is uh, quite the. But it's thrilling for me. It really is. It really is. So, can you tell us something about um, maybe? 
maybe do you have a favorite um, part of one of your books that you really like that you'd like to share? Well, there's there are a lot of passages, you know, yeah. um, there are so many pieces to it. But um, one of the things that when I was writing Firmitas, um, the, it's the Latin, as you know, for endurance, right. because the that middle book of them trudging across the continent. And, it, and you know, what does endurance really mean? What does it really do uh, to us as people? So I have a I have a, a very couple of sentences here. Yeah, please um, share. Horace turned his eyes to the expanse before them, a range of mountains covered in snow, a rolling valley peppered with wild sage. We've lost part of ourselves out there. There's no time for feelings. When every minute of every day is eaten up, there's a Latin word, firmitas. It means endurance. It's all that's left of us. No time for anything else. Makes you wonder when we get to where we're going, what kind of people will we be? Oh, that just gave me chills. <laughs> That just gave me chills. Yeah, that's great. And you know, I you you think about these, you think about these pioneers, you think about yeah. these uh people who have who have walked. They're not in, you know, it's it, it's not like wagon train and, and things you see in the movies. Yeah. They're not in the wagon. They're walking. Right, they're walking. And they walk two thousand miles. And they, you know, there was cholera and diseases and typhoid mm -hmm. and the bloody flux. And and people are, you know, you get up in the morning and you're dead at noon. Sometimes yeah. it took you that fast. And it was it's really a 2,000 mile long cemetery. Yeah. That's what the Oregon Trail was. Every 80 yards, if you yeah. were to stretch it out, there would be a grave. That kind of endurance, once you <laughs> get through that, if you survive it, mm -hmm. um, you really do wonder the, that the people that actually founded the West Coast and and secured their manifest destiny. What kind of people were they? Yeah. Uh, could 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 I do that? I <laughs> know. I mean, could you do that today? I don't. Could, I don't. Could, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, can you give birth on the prairie and then get up the <laughs> next morning and whip the uh, whip the mule and keep going? Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, and they didn't have modern medicine right. and many of them were barefoot. I, I mean, it, it just strikes me that also emotionally they had to leave so much behind yeah. on the road. Yeah. You know, they couldn't mourn. There was no right. time to mourn. There was no right. time to grieve. Um you just had to keep going. Uh, you had to keep going. You had a four month or a five month window of opportunity and the weather would change. Right. You had to finish the trip. So, so they also left their emotional parts behind. Yeah. And so when they finally get to the new world, um, all they have is their flesh and bone and this incredible sense of grit. Yeah. What but what else what else was left? You know, what is buried there? How how do you how do you come back to yourself? I mean, those are yeah. questions that I've I've asked myself a lot. Yeah. And I think it they were they were a different sort. I mean, definitely than what we see today. It's yeah. you know, and yeah. you asking that question, could we do it? I mean, that's a that's a powerful question to ask because I think by and large, the majority of people today couldn't couldn't do what they did back then. Oh, we're way too soft. I know, really. <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> very true. So let me ask you this. What was the most challenging part about writing these books? Well, I think we just touched on that a little bit. Yeah, it definitely. The, it was the hardship. Uh, the yeah. other part uh, that was very difficult for me was um, delving into the issue of slavery. Yeah. Uh, uh, I I read so much about it that it it really it it caused a, a very dark shadow over me for a long time, and there. You know, some of some people say, oh, the first part of your book is so hard to read. And it's like, you have no idea. Um, I yeah. I put in the 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 mildest kind of behavior right. uh, that that I, I didn't put in some of the some of the more grotesque 
uh, yeah. parts of slavery. I couldn't, I couldn't, right. I didn't want to get it in my head. I didn't want to yeah. build the image and I didn't, um, I held back um, on, on some of the more uh, demanding um, emotional triggers uh, about slavery because the book isn't about slavery. Yeah. It's about the opposite of slavery. It's about seeking hope. It's yeah, about faith. It it's about freedom. It's about liberty. It's about the, the, that internal urge to, to have freedom no matter what. Yes. And so I didn't, so the book wasn't about slavery and I didn't want to, I didn't want to go too deep into the book on it. Uh, but I did touch on it enough to make some people cringe. Um, and they should, yeah, um, they should. there's, they, you, we should, we should, yeah. tr we should tremble, uh, with our past. Yeah. And I think you being able to see things through Frederica's eyes was, was brilliant how you were able to, to portray that. Well, and and again, much. the reason why we loved your book so much. <laughs> so let me ask you this. Um, is there anything that in your writing journey that you've ever read that has really had an impact on you as a writer? Um, well, I, I have tried to explore my own soul so many times, <laughs> having been a, a television more of Helena's interview in part two. And going and, and becoming a winemaker yeah. later in life uh, <laughs> is, is, you know, it's a wonderful transition for me. And, and, and uh, so, so, but it took a lot of, um, it took a lot of hard work to let go of um, the religiosity and the dogma that I, I had found myself in when I was on the 700 club. Um, it took me years and it took me a 2000 mile bicycle ride just to clear my head. Wow. <laughs> so, so I, um, so I really, um, needed to find another way to look at the world and my connection to it. And I found that with Joseph Campbell. Um, and his books, The Power of the Myth, um, just ugh, amazing. And it, it, and I think Joseph Campbell really saved my life and oh, and oh. showed me that there was another there was another way to connect to that mystery without having to deify it. Mm. So um, so that that really touched me, and it really opened me up. It it opened up my heart. It opened up all the possibilities, and it, I think it it um, it it took the blinders off, and and suddenly I saw that you know the world itself is is we're connected to it all. And so Joseph Campbell, um, yeah, all of his books have been really impactful to me okay. and has uh and has opened up my my mind and my imagination wow well thank you for sharing that that's that's remarkable so if anybody's looking for those that's joseph campbell and the power mm -hmm. the of power myth. of the myth mm -hmm. okay well let and me ask you this journey <laughs> okay yeah yeah definitely and so let me ask you this what kind of advice would you give for younger writers starting out with historical fiction or with any kind of writing oh read Yes, <laughs> so important. See the books behind me. Yes, William, those are just a few of the books that I right. have. But read, 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 read. Um, reading makes you a good writer. Um, and also keep writing. Um, it's very important that you 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 get that exercise. You you yes. keep those. You keep those. Whether you're doing it longhand or you're clicking on the keys, that is a really important. I, I find sometimes I sit down and. If you'll excuse the language, I just write shit on the page. <laughs> I have, I mean, it's just junk. And, uh, but I, it doesn't stop me from writing. I have to, you know, I'll go back and, and uh, maybe it's worthless or it, maybe it's just vomit on a, on a page, or maybe it's something I can, you know, there's a nugget there, but just keep writing. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I think is really important to being a good writer is, you know, go to the conferences. Yes. Uh, uh, go to those writers' conferences. Hang out with other writers. Um, yeah. There's it, it, it. The lessons you learn is invaluable. Yeah. Um, the other thing I think that helped me a lot was um, be belonging to a writers' group. Yes, um, definitely. 
and and I don't mean like a book club that 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 just drinks a lot of wine and sometimes <laughs> talks about books. I'm talking about a real writers group, real writers with, group with 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 protocols yeah. and um and time limits and and where you really get to invest in each other's work and critique each other and you get you get you get stronger, you get better. You, it, it the growth is um, exponential when you're with a yeah. writer's group. I absolutely and wholeheartedly agree with you on that. <laughs> and it's yeah. very, it's the, it's very valuable on uh, the lessons that you can learn from each other. Um, mm -hmm. So I appreciate you sharing that. Well, let me ask you this. So is there any particular um, like quote that you live by that you like to live by in your life? Oh, oh yeah. Um, I have, I have a, I have a quote um, and it, part of it was from uh, my um, uh, being impressed by Joseph Campbell and he, you know, he was, I guess it was one of the world's greatest mythologists, but uh, I was so impressed with him. So this comes out of my book chiseled okay. um, and, and I wrote it. It's not a Joseph Campbell quote. It's my quote, but it, it, it I've been mentored through Joseph Campbell to it. And it simply is to experience wonder Ooh. is far more satisfying than to merely have faith that wonder exists. <laughs> wow. That's really profound. <laughs> Very profound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's much more important that we experience. We have the experience of being alive mm -hmm. and we have the experience of wonder um, rather than reading about it in a book or trying to believe it in dogma but but the whole point of the whole point of life itself is to experience it yeah and um you know that reminds me of um one of my favorite movies is shadowlands that is about c.s lewis's life and oh, there yeah, was so. there's a very similar quote in that about you know because he asked his students something similar to that about experience in life versus reading it and they yeah. had this whole discussion about it so i i'm very familiar with that it's very similar to that that's one of my favorite movies <laughs> i like to look at that one yeah it's about c.s lewis so you oh, can I'm imagine very familiar yeah mm -hmm. absolutely well let's let me ask you so um before i ask about what your what's coming up i would love to just let the let the listeners know a little bit about um, I know that you've done some really phenomenal interviews on your own, but can you tell us what it was like to interview Maya Angelou? She, oh, uh, she, it was when, it was my, it was when Maya Angelou came out with the book, I Know Why the Cage Bird, Cage Sings. Bird Sings, right, and, um, and so she was very young, as I was at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and she, um, so it was really the release of her book. And I was on, I was the host of a, of a talk show in San Diego. Mm -hmm. We had authors come in and cooks and yeah, it was a morning show. Right. And, uh, and she came in with that baritone voice <laughs> and she sat down at the table. And even then as a, as a young, yeah, uh, she, she must've been in her, um, she might have been in her 30s, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and but she she sat there with this amazing voice and read out of her book. Oh. The Cape Bird. And I there's a I actually there was a photographer there at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there like this. Yes. Just <laughs> listening to her. And they took a picture of me and I'm just like, oh, my. Yes. And I had never heard of Maya Angelou before. Oh. But so this was my first um, this was my first introduction to this amazing prophet, uh, this amazing <laughs> woman. Um, mm -hmm. it, yes, I was thunderstruck. Yeah, I can imagine because I, I, I just just listening to her voice on anything, <laughs> you know, is, is pretty amazing. <laughs> well, oh. Danuta, can you tell us a little bit about what's about? I know you don't want to give everything away, but can you give us a little, you know, preview about what you're working on now and maybe any events that you have coming up? Well, it's the I've, right now it's all about writing. Yes. It's about finishing yes. this third book. And right. I have to tell you, when you write a trilogy, the <laughs> pressure is on, baby. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have had so many people say, okay, when's the next book coming? What's <laughs> I'm one of them, and, so. 
my God. <laughs> and the, the, the other part of the pressure is that um, the third book has to be better than the first two. I'm, 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 I, it has to, it, it's, it's sort of like you're watching a, a, a television series, right? Yeah. And that third season, you know, it really has to come in with a wallop or it's the, the third act of a play. It has to deliver. It has, it, you know, it has to have all the bells and whistles and twists and turns and, um, and trouble, lots of trouble. Yeah. And then it's got to have some, some satisfying resolution. And um, I love these characters so much. Yes. Uh, and I'm sitting there. I, you know, when now when I'm writing, it's not like writing at all because I'm just channeling these characters <laughs> and they're leading me. They're telling me what they want to do. And sometimes they get out of hand. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so it is a real challenge now to write this book, not only with um, heart and soul, and and with a literary content um mm -hmm. uh, so uh, with with a literary tone right. but but also to satisfy some pretty complex issues that are going on oh, in yeah. 19th century Oregon right um and two of the major two of the major historical turning points in the history of Oregon was the Whitman massacre and the gold rush Mm -hmm. And so bringing those two um, historical events that happened just a few years apart uh, and, and having them impact the story with my characters yeah. uh, is, is it's, it's a thrilling ride. Uh, I'll tell you that it's a thrilling ride. Uh, I'm a third of the way through it. Okay. I've got 32,000 words done <laughs> in the first draft. Yes. which is the crap on the page. I mean, I have to go back and fix it, you know, because it's, but, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a, I'm a third of the way through it. And um, I'm really excited about it because for the first time in a long time, I have found the writing uh, just flowing. Oh, that's great. And, and, you know, when you get, when you get really good characters and, you, yes. and you've got, you've got, you've got, you've got your mojo going, you're in the yeah. zone. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It it's, it's amazing. You know, mm -hmm. I'm doing like almost thousand words a day and I'm, That's and great. I have to, you know, the, I'm, my fingertips are sizzling, but yeah. then I have to go back and fix a lot of stuff, but, <laughs> yeah. but um, it is really, it's a thrilling ride. So if you've read, and I know you have um, Libertas and Firmitas, well, buckle up, baby. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're excited. I'm so excited for the next one. And we will be sure to like have a huge release day whenever on our website and everything when, oh, your, when your new book comes out. We really oh, appreciate you. you being on the show today. Thank you so well, very, very much. Thank you. Thank you for the honor. It was such a privilege when I got that. Um, it was the first runner up to, to yes. the historical fiction of the year last year. And I was just or two years ago, I was just yes. amazed. I was just, uh, it was such a privilege well, and it such was an honor. Very, very well deserved. And and again, everyone can go to the website and pull up the reviews that we did for Fermatas and Libertas. And you can, there's buy links there where you can buy the book immediately. And you can learn more about Danuta and her books at www.danutapfeiffer.com. And you will find the link and more in info in today's episode description. You can also go to our website at the Historical Fiction Company. Click on the book reviews again, and please search for those editorial reviews for those two books. And both of them received five stars and awards in the 2021 and 2022 HFC contests. As always, we thank everyone for listening, and please don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. Next week's episode, we are featuring historical author Janet Wortman. This is DK Marley with the History Bards podcast. Keep making history and keep listening.